Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Thanks, Miliam, for the introduction, and um, good to be here. I I did have some vague idea about doing some breakouts in this, but with 400 people, I don't really it's see that as really very practical. So it might just be me and a few a few pictures, um, and hopefully enough information that you can continue the conversation um, with your own teams later. So um. Let me just set some context on this. So uh, I, th I did share the, the page, the link to the description of this workshop, um, which I'm just going to read out because it's very short. Uh, the Power of Storytelling Narrative in Scrum Events, it's called. Um, and I'll read it. The Scrum Guide describes clearly all five Scrum events, but in typical Scrum Guide fashion does not tell us how we should run these meetings. Thank goodness. One method we can apply is to use storytelling, in particular narrative structure. And that's what I'm going to focus on today is narrative structure. Understanding good narrative will help us structure all our events, but mostly it's um, especially sprint planning, review and retrospective. Uh, in this session, I'll teach a simple and powerful structure to both contain the Scrum events and make them infinitely more imaginative. That's the intent anyway. So let's see how we go with that. Um, so. There's lots of different ways of, of running planning meetings and um, review meetings and retrospectives. And um, probably most people in this audience are, are familiar with many different ways of doing these things. Um, one of the methods that people use for retrospectives, for example, is to create a timeline. And a timeline, um, people then stick notes on, the, on a board or something to say that such and such an event happened at this point in time and such and such an event happened later on at this point in time. Some teams even go as fast to sort of have a, a, an above and below a line where it's like this thing happened and I liked it or this thing happened and I didn't like it. So you get a sense of, um, um, you get a sense of, uh, you know, the things we want to work on, things we want to improve. So that's one method of doing it. Um, and there's, uh, I've seen teams use storytelling dice to, to tell stories as well with, with, um, within a retrospective, to throw the dice and see what pictures come up and kind of make a narrative out of it. The problem with um, both of those approaches and other approaches as well is they end up, um, we end up listing things that happen. We create a, a kind of a, a, a list of events rather than an actual narrative. An actual narrative take is, requires more than just this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, right? It requires a connection between these things. Um, it requires um, a cause and effect, if you like. That's what it requires. It requires a cause and effect, like any, any good story. Um, it, and, and in fact, it like the empirical process itself. What we do one thing and it causes something else to happen. Um, that's the whole way of working in Scrum, isn't it? Is to you know, run experiments and see what happens as a result of this. We do this thing and this thing happens. So why not kind of take that idea and build that into the Scrum events themselves? And so I've been thinking about storytelling quite a lot. I learned um, a really interesting, interesting, it's very simple actually, a very simple structure for storytelling that, that seems to sort of, for me, encapsulate the spirit of story. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. And then I want to play with it a little bit. So I'll start off by just putting up my screen so you can see it. Um, it's just a, one, two, three, four, five, six lines. So let me share that. There it is, the story spine. It'll be familiar to you, right? Um, if you think about any fairy story you've heard, they usually begin in that way, don't they? Once upon a time, there was a something, something, something who did blah, 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 blah. And once upon a time, there was a, a princess who was trapped in a tower. Once upon a time, there was a frog who used to be a king. Once upon a time, um, there was a little girl who visited her grandmother on a regular basis, all right? So we set the scene essentially so we we establish a beginning and we and we give it an everyday so this is the who and the what 
we've got a who and a what, and then we've got, and this is what they tended to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we introduced this idea of something different happening, because without that, there's no story, right? Other than that, it's just, you know, establishing the status quo, essentially. So once upon a time and every day until one day, this event that occurs, this shift or this change or this drama that plays out, causes other things to happen. And this is the core of this narrative structure, this line here. And because of that. Now, and because of that is an iterative thing, which is why it's um, bracketed and starred in that way. No, it's a notation for do this again. So and because of that, and because of that, and because of that. So it's something happens, and as a result of that thing happening, something else happens. They're, they're completely connected. They're not unrelated. It's not like saying, um, you know, I went to the station this morning, uh, and I bought a coffee, uh, and the train was late, and uh, I sat next to a man in a bowler hat. So you did all those things, but they're not connected in any way. There's no story in there. You're not telling a story. So there has to be a because of that. I got to the station and the train was late. And because of that, what happened because the train was late, it was fuller than usual, maybe. There were too many people on the train. And because of that, I didn't get my usual seat on the train. Because of that, I arrived at the other end disgruntled and dismayed and upset. Because of that, I had a bad day at work. One thing leads to another and we can trace the cause and effect back sometimes, or very mostly we can trace it back. And we might even be able to predict <laughs> sometimes what's gonna happen next because of the mood we're in or because of an event that happened. So um, this is what the part, this is the story. The story lies in here because of that. But it has to wrap up at some point. So there, there needs to be an ending point and, and every good fairy story has a, a happily ever after at the end. So finally, and ever since that day. So finally, they settled down, built a castle, and lived happily ever after. Right? So that's the structure. Now, we don't live in fairyland, and we don't talk in this way. We don't talk using this kind of language. So I sort of um, converted it, if you like, into a, a bit more of a general, general pattern. So Once Upon a Time is essentially um, an introduction to the story and a setting of the scene. The everyday establishes the status quo, establishes where we are now. This is the way things are. Then there's a dramatic moment that changes the way things are. And there's a cause and effect here. So what I want you to pay attention to is the iterative nature of this. So I've made the star red, so you can kind of like call it out, the little red asterisk there. The cause and effect, we build a story. So one thing happens, it causes something else to happen, it causes something else to happen until we finally get to a release or a resolution of the situation. And, the, and one of the key things about story is that we must change our uh, awareness at the end of a story. We can't end the story in the same place that we began the story. Otherwise, there's no development, there's no, there's no, um, there's no awakening, there's no learning. And every story that we tell takes us to a new place. It might take us up to a new place. It might take us down, is that intentional? There we go. Um, so now let's look at that. I want to look at that in, um, in terms of a picture. So here we are, I've put this into um, sort of a framework really. This is what I wanna show in terms of like changing um, the place we end up in. So wherever we start from, we don't want to end up on that same horizontal that we started with because there's no change, there's no awakening, there's no learning in that. So we're moving towards a different place. There's also uh, an, an important narrative structure that some of you might be familiar with called the hero's journey. And um, the hero's journey is the story of someone leaving home to go on an adventure. Um, and they usually end up returning home, but they don't return home the same. They return home changed. So our new place is, is a mental place rather than a necessarily a physical, might be a physical place, but you can come back to your home at the end of a story, but you're coming back different than when you left. You're coming back with learning. Um, you know, the Odyssey is a, a great example of that. 
so is Star Wars, by the way. Um, and one of the one of the interesting things about this is a side a, a sidetrack, but one of the interesting things about the hero's journey is that the hero is called, and they say no, I'm not going to go. That's the common pattern. So no, I can't go. I've got too many other things going on with 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 Luke Skywalker. I've got to be here for my aunt and uncle. Um, and it's always on the second call, or maybe even the third call, that they finally go. And there has to be some change in their circumstances to get them to do that. In in uh, in the Star Wars scenario, the the aunt and uncle are killed, so now he's got nothing to stay behind for. So he goes, and he goes off on a classic hero's journey, essentially. Um, and Odysseus does the same. He resists it, and then finally he he agrees to it. So there's a similarity between what we're looking at here and and the, and the classic hero's journey, um, although they're not identical by any means. So here we're, we're setting the scene and we're establishing our status quo. Then we've got this thing I'm calling a dramatic moment. Okay, it doesn't have to be um, hugely dramatic. It's a shift. It's a change. Something's different to what it was before. And then we've got this build of cause and effect. Now that build can go up as well as down, but it doesn't stay in the same place. It doesn't sort of hop along on the same level. It's not an and then and then and then and then. It's the because of that, because of that, because of that. Okay, it's changing things and it's relating things and keeping them connected together until we finally get to a release and a resolution um, and uh, an awakened state in a new learning. Now, as I was, I've taught this um, in many different contexts, actually, uh, for work. And, but as when um, Ilian asked me to, to do something here, and it was you know, very focused around agility and scrum, um for scrum and in fact it's focused um, for scrum masters isn't it this event so i try to think about well, what's the relationship here and it was almost like a, a light bulb went off and i thought oh, of course yeah this is this is this is scrum what we're looking at here is scrum um so i thought that'd be fun to make a, a scrum picture out of out of this so here here we are it's the scrum spine the scrum spine using exactly the same language um, and you might recognize the, the picture in a sense, you know, with the, with the loop in the middle there. So introduce and set the scene. This is a sprint, if you like, isn't it? It's the, it's the, it's the description of a sprint here. At the beginning of the sprint, we plan, we introduce and we set the scene and we establish where we are. We establish um, what has been built so far. We look at the backlog, which is that image there. We look at the backlog and we say, um, this is what we've got so far. This is what's remaining to be done. Let's figure out what we're going to do. The dramatic moment that I'm, I'm calling the dramatic moment here is the, is the, um, the setting of the sprint goal and the, the building of the sprint backlog. Now that in itself is an iterative process. We're going, we're kind of going around and around and around here. So I'll look at that fractal model in a minute as well. Um, so because we've made the sprint, we've, we've set the sprint goal and we've made a sprint backlog, we can now go into the work we can go and do the work and so the, the the main part of the sprint of course is in here um where we're um iterating through the work and meeting regularly to talk about how we're doing the work and what needs to be done and are we on track and all those other good questions that we ask each other so we're building it and then at the end of that period of building time boxed of course um we release we have a release we have resolution the resolution is we wanted to make this thing now we've made it and now we give it to the we give it to our customers and we um gather together for a retrospective and we talk about how things were so at the end of this all we've um we've released something and we have an awakened state of course there's one thing missing here so in the next picture i've put it in which is that second feedback arrow so where does that learning go it has to go somewhere in our case it goes back to the back to the backlog and back to the process so we've got new learning, an awakened state, new learning, and that new learning helps us to um, improve the backlog and um, improve the way that we work as well. And so we go around again. So what we've got there using the story spine is a narrative structure for, for the Scrum Sprint itself. Now we can look at that in a little more detail. <laughs> Each of the events, someone might need to mute. Uh, yeah, let me mute them. Uh, again, mm -hmm. people should be muted when they come in, but for whatever reason, they unmute. Uh, okay. I can't see anybody that's unmuted. Uh, so please continue. Maybe they mute them themselves. All right. 
by the way, uh, Tobias, uh, there are a couple of people saying like, I'm assuming you'll get to it, but to provide an example of this spine, uh, there's a couple of comments in the chat. Yes, okay. Thank you. It would be awesome if there's a re-engineering initiative that we could correlate this to as an example. Okay. Okay. Um, I might, and I might not get to examples, all right? Um, the examples need to come from you, in fact. Um, this is theory, right? The, the application of this is up to you. I can give you examples of, of, of my own experience, but I'm not sure that it's that valuable given the short space of time that we've got. So, um, the other thing I wanted to look at here was, the, um, so this is the, the overall, this is the sprint, if you like. This is the using the story spine to tell a story of a scrum sprint, right? It has all of the elements in there um, and we've got structure. The thing I'd like to specifically look at is the, um, is the retrospective. We can also apply this to the planning meeting. So um, if I show you another picture, get this out of the way. Um, here, this fractal model picture. Look at that for a moment. So here's the same structure that we were just looking at, the, the large, you know, introduce the scene, establish what it is, dramatic moment, cause and effect, release resolution. At any point in time, we can look at a story within the story. And I'll give you an example here from, from your own life, right? So if we look at this, our, our life as a story, all right, it has a beginning where we're born and it has an end state where we're gonna die, we are about to die. Um, obviously along that storyline of our life, we've got many small stories that happen there. There's the story of our first day at school. There's the story of leaving home. There's a story of going to college. There's a story of first, you know, starting a new job. There's a story of uh, starting a different job. There's a story of promotion. You know, there are thousands upon thousands of stories within the story of your life. And each one of those stories has the same structure has exactly the same structure in there. So we can tease out, and we can tease out smaller and smaller stories. One of the examples I used um, when I'm teaching the, the one day workshop here is to ask people to tell the story of um, how they arrived at the workshop from when they woke up in the morning to now. So they're telling a story of a couple of hours um, of something that's probably not that interesting. And yet, depending on how they tell the story, it can become very interesting, in fact, people's journey to work, essentially people, the journey to work story. Um, but that story has the same structure, same narrative structure here that everything else, that the, that the larger story has that it's contained within. And within one of those stories, like that one, you're gonna have, you're gonna have um, stories within that as well. So let's look at the, um, Let's look at a planning meeting in Scrum. This is, a, this is what I wanted you to kind of do in breakout, but I really don't think breakout is gonna, is gonna work with such a large group here. So we'll just kind of, I'll just talk it through. Um, perhaps we can use the chat window. Life has many dramatic moments. Thank you. Yeah, I like these comments that are coming in. Good to see some familiar names coming up in here as well. Hi there. Um, I don't want to look at that just yet. Right. Um, let's go back to Scrum. Let's go back to the Scrum picture. So if you were doing a planning meeting, um, it's basically this section here. But what's happening um, in the planning meeting is that you're um, introducing it, like I said, with the product backlog and establishing where you are in the process right now. So what is your status quo? Your status quo is the product as is, right? The product that you've made so far. Um, and you're incorporating the, obviously the feedback from your customers, that's, that's part of the backlog now you've got, and you've got your product goal. Then you're going to start working on the, um, sprint goal and the sprint backlog. Now, 
that would be that would be um, the fractal part of this would be that that becomes the um, cause and effect part of this. All right. So it might be that your product owner comes in with a sprint goal, as sometimes happens in a planning meeting, or it might be that the sprint goal itself emerges from the choice of work that you do. But you know, both models are fine. Um, but if you, you can imagine that the product owner comes into the meeting and says, OK, this is the goal of, of, of this sprint. Um, I remember one product owner coming into a meeting um, with the team I was working for, and he we didn't usually have a goal up front, but he came in this time and he said, um, the sprint goal for this sprint is make it not suck. That was all he gave us, make it not suck. Um, and we sort of knew what he, what he meant and it, it became quite clear. It was like we'd, we'd hurried, we'd done things in a hurry and we had to you know, improve it and make it look better than it did, um, make it more engaging. And so the focus of that sprint was on building a sprint backlog towards that goal of improving the look and it's mostly about proving the look and feel, but there was also some, some back end cleanup and stuff to do as well. So things just operated more smoothly. Um, he was one of those rare product owners that recognized the importance of not building up technical debt. Oh, that there were more people like that. Um, but he was a good one. So, um, so what we had then was a kind of a cause and effect. Oh, we could do such and such a piece of work. Oh, and if we did that, that would lead us to doing this other thing. Oh, and if we're in that part of the code, we could probably fix that thing as well. So there's a because of that, because of that, because of that happening there. Now, the resolution at this at this smaller scale would be the completion of the backlog of the sprint backlog. That would be the resolution there and an awakened state in a new learning so that we can then go into the next phase of this, which is building this thing. So we kind of condensed down and we've still got the same story structure in there. But what I especially want to look at is um, in the time that we've got is the um, retrospective part of this. So um, how will I do this? I, I think we might just need to talk it through. So I don't know, Milian, is it possible to do breakouts? I mean, it is. Um, is it? Because if, if we could put people into groups of about six, five or six, that would be amazing. Uh, so if we do... Well, I'll stop the share for a moment. Let me just see. I'm going to just share the link for that picture that I just gave you. Ninety breakout rooms. Is that can or it, can seventy it seventy something? So let me see. Like sorry, 70. my phone was on mute. I apologize. I have Angel down here for you in the lobby. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Bye. Oh, could you please turn your? Uh, you, um, people might be using their phone. Miss Miller, how can I help you? Um. Hello, Miss Miller. To mute uh, people. Sorry, I'm gonna mute her. Uh, oh. One moment. My God, I think. Uh, I don't know if it's maybe I can uh, let me just uh, do this. Uh, she just muted it. Yeah. I think I muted her. Uh, so the most I can create is 50 breakout rooms, which should be fine to buy. 50? Yeah. How many does that put in each one? About eight people? Something yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can have slightly slightly bigger than a, than a, than a recommended scrum team size in your breakout room. But what I'd like you to do, using any tool you like, and there is a um, there's a mural board, isn't there, that you can use if you want to, or or any other tool that comes to hand. Um, I would like you to take those elements that we just looked at. So Tobias, something weird is going on. Um, where like I, and I haven't never facilitated room this big, and we can give it a try, um, but. It only puts people in the first seven rooms. Oh, maybe yeah. No, it's. I think it's fine. It only. Uh, no, it's fine. It for some reason opened up the first seven and then the collapsed the first. So we can give it a try. Um, right again. It looks we'll like it's going to work. Time. Yeah, it's fifty. For how long would you like to do it? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. And then we can debrief it afterwards. 
All right. Let me what are the tell you what you're going to do here? before you open the rooms, though. Before you open the rooms, I'd like to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to take these elements, okay, that we, we just looked at, the introduction, establishing what is dramatic moment, cause effect, release resolution, and awakened state of new learning. Or you can take them from the original story spine, which is a once upon a time language, if, that, if that's preference. Um, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about um, how you might structure a retrospective from that. Before you go into your rooms, one of the things I want to talk about is um, go back to this. I'll go back to the story spine picture and just share my screen again. Hold on a sec before we do the breakouts. People are asking if you can, uh, yeah. So there, there it is. is. Right. Um, the story spine. So um, that moment, that dramatic moment thing is, um, is really important to storytelling. What's it, what we want to remember is that a, when you hear a good story, it doesn't just start at the beginning and go through in this order. Um, a story can start anywhere. You can start um, from the release resolution. You can start from the dramatic moment itself. You can start from one of the cause effects of it. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick example of that from um, a TV show called Breaking Bad that some of you might be familiar with. Um, the series Breaking Bad, it doesn't matter what it's about, but one of the episodes opens up with um, a van, uh, like a camper van careering downhill um, with two naked men inside and a whole bunch of um, uh, chemistry equipment being flung around in this van. Uh, that's the beginning of the story, the beginning of the episode, right? So that's not how the story starts, obviously. It's somewhere deep in the midst of the story, that incident. But what it does is it makes you want to watch the rest of it because you want to know how they got there and what's going to happen afterwards. So basically, they bring you in somewhere around, I don't know, the towards the release resolution, possibly, quite late in the story. They bring you in there. And then they work backwards to introduce then when the episode starts properly, it goes back to introducing the scene and establishing what is. And all the time you're watching it, you're waiting to see when is it going to get to that moment when they're going crashing down the hill naked in, in their van. And of course, it does get there. And then you want to know what happens afterwards, which you do, because it has to resolve. The story has to resolve. Um, so it's, a, it's um, a way of bringing you into a story. And it's a way of getting your focus very quickly. So what I want you to think about when you're doing a retrospective is not um, a timeline. It's not, not what happened first, then what happened next, and then what happened next. It's what was the most important thing that happened in the retrospective over the last two, sorry, in the spring, over the last two weeks, what was the most important event that happened? And use that as your central point, your dramatic moment, and work backwards and forwards from that. So how did we get to that moment? And what happens after that moment, right? So you're building sort of forward and back from that. And that becomes your central point. And then look at, did it resolve? Did that resolve or did it not resolve? And maybe you're in your sprint, it didn't resolve. And so that means that you have some work to do right now to resolve it in some way. Maybe there's some additional, additional resolution that you have to do. So I want you to think about it in that way, rather than just starting at the beginning and plodding, plodding through step by step. I want you to think about the retrospective, the most important thing that happened. You can use someone's real experience of a retrospective for this, or you can just do an imaginary one. Either way would work. And I, you know, they are slightly big groups, but we'll see if they will. We'll I mean, see. I'm assuming that everybody will be engaged. Sometimes people are listening, but they can't really participate. They don't want to miss out. So I think it, it should be fine. Like having there might just be a few in each room who's actually participating. Yeah, in this yeah. having yeah. eight people in each room, I think, is okay. Okay. Hopefully there are Let's see what happens. So 10 minutes, please. And then that gives us a, you know, eight minute debrief afterwards. Okay. Right. All right. Sounds okay. good. Um, and I'll read while you're in there, I'll be looking at your questions on the chat window and seeing how to respond to those. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so 10 minute breakout room. Breakout rooms. Here we go. So I'm clicking open. Let's see if anything happens here. Ten minutes. It goes gray, and then 
I don't know if people are going in. Um, it goes great when I click it, like it's sending people, but it doesn't look like the device. Let me just double check here. It may just take a few minutes. Uh, again, I've never experienced the most I've had is like 50, 60 people. In this is one of those situations. Uh, this is like Scrum at scale, isn't it? And we couldn't test it. We didn't, we didn't have you here to run the test beforehand. It's like yeah. testing. Oh, God, it's just the, the sheer volume of groups. <laughs> Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm clicking. The participant. But... Uh, I'm watching the participant uh, list kind of decline very slowly. Oh, so maybe nice. that's what's so happening. Went from four ten to now three sixty, but it might take a few minutes for everybody to get allocated. Oh, or it's people that, right. leaving because they know they're going to be going to a breakout room. Oh, could be. Uh, could be. Uh, you scared uh, them off. Yeah, Liliana, this right. <laughs> If this is the rate it's going at, it, it's going to be yeah. you know hours before people get out. So we might just have to cancel yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's safe to say that. I would say that so uh, we we ran a test and it didn't give us the result we wanted, and now we have to uh, inspect and well, we've done the inspection. Now we just got to adapt, right? So now we're going to adapt to um, keeping you all here, get everyone back in. That, that, can, is the that can be our retrospective. That that's the event that we just uh, tried, and we can <laughs> so now how you will, yes, now you all know, Imogen. Thank you. Now you all know. Uh, next time you're on a Zoom call with 400 people, don't attempt breakout rooms. <laughs> in your best interest, all right. So there's valuable learning going on in in one direction or another. Great. So. Um, Let's just talk about what you might have talked about in your own rooms. <laughs> I'll just give some ideas there. I mean, I've given one already, which is the, the idea of um, taking the focus in the retrospective uh, on, the on the most important thing or the most worrying thing or the most exciting thing that happened in the last sprint. That, that's where you start from. Okay, so we're, again, we're not just kind of like trying to get it in, in order. We're looking at the looking at the beginning of it. Let me actually, I'll show I'll share a picture here with you that I, it, it's, um, it's a drawing from a flip chart that I, I used in one of my- uh, one Tobias, of my people are asking, there's a couple of, uh, could you share your screen and uh, I- I'm going to share my screen, yeah, but I have to find the picture first. And Rico had, a, I think- a good I'm gonna share my screen. Using story spine to explain what just happened, uh, so. Oh, sorry. Say that again. That's interesting. That's uh, Rickard had a suggestion to use the sort, uh, uh, story uh, spine to explain oh. what just happened, i.e. the experiment. Richard, lovely idea. Let's do that. Let's just do it. All right. So let's come back to that. I'll share my screen. I won't worry about the fractal model for now. Go to... Um, Richard, would you like to try and attempt to talk us through what happened using this? That's Richard who just put the comment in there. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, turn yeah. your volume up. Yeah, so so I'd say uh, the scene would be, you know, we were trying to uh, to get collaboration going. Okay. And we're trying to get this four four hundred people going. Uh, I think that's how it will be uh, dramatic moment in terms of we're trying it out. And the effect is that we're seeing multiple things happening. Uh, you know, Zoom not working properly. I'm watching the participants drop number drop in the last five minutes before we get into Zoom. The conversation was going on. People dropping, uh, and then you know, so the awakened state, the new learning is that we learned that Zoom can't handle that much. <laughs> or there's also possibly people just doesn't want to talk, so it's that running way. Okay, so that's kind of yeah, yeah. So it worked for you, that didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So our scene was um, we're all on Zoom. Um, we're familiar with Zoom. We all think we know how Zoom works, and you know there was a little bit of concern about should we do breakout rooms, and then the dramatic moment was, um, I suppose it was Milian trying to open the breakout rooms. Um, and because he attempted to open the breakout rooms, what happened? The first thing that happened was they opened, but it was very slow. 
So because there were so many people here, the breakout rooms opened really slowly. Because they opened really slowly, people were not getting in to have the conversations they wanted to have. And because people were not getting in to come have the conversations they have, we quickly decided to abandon the plan and come back to center, come back all together. That's the release and the resolution. And as Richard pointed out, our awakened state is some learning about Zoom and uh, maybe about the, something about people being threatened by being pushed into conversation in small rooms and dropping out. We don't know if that happens or not, but that's possible. So that was interesting. Thank you, Richard. I can also attempt maybe, Tobias, if, you, if you're okay with that, uh, just quickly maybe to share my kind of thought on this. Um, Go ahead. So like uh, I work with this uh, small software development company maybe even 10 years ago now. And uh, I was trying to introduce Scrum to them and they had specific, you know, developers, testers, BAs, typical things that you probably still see. And I was trying to establish you know, Scrum. And one of the things that happened, they would have like a beer o'clock every uh, uh, Friday and they would demo usually on Monday. Um, so like a lot of times the testers uh, would get pissed because they would have to test the weekends and they wouldn't get a chance to enjoy the beer o'clock and uh, software engineers would make sure by, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, two o'clock on Friday, they were done with everything and that they can, you know, uh, get, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to drink. So the dramatic moment, I guess, the introduction, the introduction of the scene is that, you know, maybe introduction of the scrum establishing, you know, what is, and then the dr dramatic moment is that you had this conflict between, um, between testers and developers and, or software engineers, I guess we in scrum, we call everybody developers, but, um, the issue was essentially where uh, uh, even, you know, some of the developers uh, or one developer, I still remember, said that testing is below his pay grade, mm -hmm. right? Um, so now as far as like trying, I said, you know, uh, uh, maybe going into cause and effect, um, what needs to be true for everybody to enjoy the beer o'clock, um, you know, every Friday, not just on the Friday because there were ending sprints every, it was two week sprints. So uh, you could enjoy one uh, week, but the other one was, you know, let's get it done. Um, so from, from a release resolution, what they started thinking about in a retrospective is how do they sequence the work? Like, you know, pick the smaller work at the beginning of the sprint, so everybody can, you know, focus on that. Uh, then they will have bigger chunks of work in the middle of the sprint. And at the end of the sprint, it was, you know, who, you know, all hands on, whoever needs to test or do whatever to get things done. So we have finished items and, you know, meet our sprint goal at the end of the sprint. So there was, you know, looking at it retrospectively, <laughs> there was this awakened state of new learning that it's not just about me as a developer getting my things done or, you know, the testers or BAs getting, but it's this awakened state of like, hey, you know, we're responsible as a team for this whole thing. And it's not just me as a developer thinking about what's coming in the next sprint or even starting that work, but working as a team to get stuff done in a sprint, you know. So I don't know if that makes sense to, the, to, uh, uh, to people, but this is what reminded me uh, of that specific story or that situation that I dealt with almost a, a decade ago. Nice, thank you, yeah. Um, so you're telling a story about something that already happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is what we're doing in a retrospective, in a retrospective, isn't it? We're telling the story about something that's happened in the past. When we're telling this, using the story spine in the planning meeting, we're telling the story about the future, essentially. Um, so you can think about um, this structure here. The once upon a time, there's, there's basically two ways of, of telling stories, if you like. Um, one is about telling stories about something that happened in the past. And one is about telling what I might call vision stories. So you've got reflection stories, and you've got vision stories. Mm -hmm. So a vision story starts with once upon a time is now. And ever since that day is some point in the future. So that's the kind of story a new uh, CEO or a new executive director might tell to the organization he or she has just joined. Okay, so that kind of, well, okay, so here I am, you know, to run this company, and this is where I see you are now. 
And um, what I would like to have happen is, and then they sort of give, go through the scenario of the story they're going to tell them, because we'll do that and then we'll do this. And because of that, we'll build on this other thing and then we'll make these products and da 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 da, -da, -da. And then finally, um, we'll be the market leader in this, in this sector. All right. And that's your, and that's your ever since that day will be the market. So you're telling a story about what you hope to have happen. Um, on a less grand scale, that's what we're doing in a planning meeting. We're telling the story about intent. All right. So we want to get the stakeholders and the product owner and the developers kind of aligned on the intent of what the outcome is going to be. And then when we do the retrospective, we're telling the story the other way around. We're starting off with once upon a time is sometime in the past, and we're bringing it up to today, which is where we are now. And ever since that day, we're here and we learned this, and we're going to now do this other thing, move into the next story. So this, there's a sort of stories of the past and stories of the future that we're telling using the, exactly the same structure. Jenny uh, has a question. Could we use a vision stories for risk assessments since a risk is something that hasn't happened yet? In a way, uh, that's, um, you know, people often ask about how Agile deals with, with risk. Um, uh, you know, how does it manage risk? And the whole of the, um, an Agile process is about risk management, isn't it? Because it's about figuring out what the most important thing is to do now. And sometimes the most important thing is to mitigate something and make sure that we can get past this thing. Otherwise we won't know where to go. So we're already kind of built in um, risk, risk assessment into the whole agile process. Um, so yes, I would say that you, you can use this story in all kinds of contexts. It's, it's really quite surprising, this structure. The thing I want to look at quickly that I think might be helpful in terms of um, uh, it's a bit scribbly, but this was from a, a flip chart uh, in a class I was in. I just thought it might be useful. So stories are all around us, right? And so if we look at um, very often, it's the event that is the first thing to come to our attention. So that's why I'm saying in a retrospective, it's quite, it's quite good to sometimes focus on what was the big thing, the big important thing, or the, uh, the exciting thing, or the terrible thing that happened. Because that gives you, this gives you a sort of pivot almost to, to work on. Um, many of you might have experienced this as, as managers. Um, you've got, you might have people coming to you to complain about something. You might get this as a parent as well, right? Um, some big event happens, some big fight breaks out or some argument breaks out and someone comes and complains. He did this and they did that and this is happening. Um, and we can kind of like, this, this idea of kind of unwinding from the event itself. Um, so we might want to ask, well, what happened just before that? What happened just before that thing that you're telling me about? Because we can trace it back. And very often, when we do that, we take people out of that emotional state they are in when, when a, a big event like that has happened. And we get them back into their thinking brain because they have to think in order to think, well, what did happen before that? And, uh, and the best case scenario is when they recognize that they had a part in this. Um, and that, that's rare, but it can happen. Um, and then you're moving forward from it. Okay, so this is where we are. We can't change the past. What would you like to have happen now? And so that second picture down the bottom here is um, your dramatic moment. You're trying to understand it and going, going back over what, you know, what happened just before that, what happened just before that, what happened just before that. And then we take it forward into some sort of resolution. You can use that structure also for your... Um, for your retrospective, um, particularly if it was a sprint that didn't go that well, you know, because when, when a sprint doesn't go well, the first thing we tend to do as humans is look for whose fault it was. Well, corporate humans, I would say, it's maybe not humans, but people in the corporate world, we look for blame. We look to say, well, who they, they did that and he did that and, you know, it wasn't our fault. Um, which is of course not that useful. So we can we can use this kind of unwinding idea, going from the event, unwinding the event, looking at our own part in it, our own ownership, in order to resolve it and move forward. So that might be another um, interesting approach in a in a retrospective. If a retrospective has gone well, you may not need to use a structure like that, but it still might be useful to, um, you know, to start. Oh, where did it go? Sorry about that. 
there. It might be good to start here. It's a good starting point. Or it may be that you actually start further up with some, in some kind of cause and effect. That might be the thing that sticks in your mind. And then working it back from that, you figure out what it was. What was the incident that caused all those things to happen? Um, that can be helpful too. Um, so it's, it's really kind of going with what, what's, what's the burning issue of the moment for people. Um, so and often it is We common. have a couple of minutes left, but Tim yeah. has a good question here. Like, what's the value of picking the right dramatic moment? Well, it's not so much a right dramatic moment. It's the thing that's uppermost in people's mind. Um, so, you know, in, in a retrospective context, I, I think it's about what's uppermost in people's mind. If you've got five people in your team and they all have, a, you know, a different moment, then really there's nothing major there but if they've all focused on oh that thing that happened it was so awful well let's start with that because everyone's focused on it anyway so why would we not start with it so that's the value of kind of trying to figure out if there's some commonality between our remembering of the past two weeks is there some incident there that we need to spend some time with so rather than just saying you know what we liked what we didn't like which is fine of course i mean that's you know that's the traditional way of doing it um we're getting more into some, some narrative here. And the, the benefit of the narrative is it one of the things it does is it brings people together as a group um, because we're sharing a story. We're not just sharing work, we're sharing a story. We're part of the story, we're in it. Uh, lots, of, lots of things coming up here. Uh, in a retro, the dramatic effect could be the aha moment, yes. Absolutely. It's, it could be positive as well as, well as uh, very often is positive. In fact, it doesn't have to be a negative thing by any means. The effect might be the only thing you have visibility to as a scrum master and hence a good starting point to ask a question. That's a great point, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, because the scrum master is not immersed in the work in the way that developers are, their visibility is um, is less in the detail and more in the bigger picture. But it might be very much so that this particular incident is something they've noticed, you know, the, the servers crashing or um, or it might be as a result of the review when we thought we understood what the customers were asking and it turned out we didn't. So that's, a, you know, that's obviously a visible thing. So that might be another good reason to do it. Okay. Yeah, there's no way I can kind of like uh, respond to all the questions here. Um, but there's some of not questions. They're just, they're just really, really great comments. Um, Olive, Olivia, I met my wife. Is it plus or minus? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So we want an emotional connection with the problem or task we're doing. Um, Tim, I would say yes, we do. We want an emotional connection with our work. Absolutely. I, I have no, no qualms about using that, that terminology. Um, we want to be emotionally connected with the people in our team and with the work that we do. If we're not, um, we, we, we can't possibly do it um, with passion, which is really what's required. So I think we're out of time. Um, it's been a little bit a little bit of an experiment this session, and I hope we've learned something, maybe not that we were intending to teach, but nevertheless, there's always learning moments. And um, if you ever experiment with this in a retrospective, find me on LinkedIn and tell me about it, because I'd love to hear. <laughs> Thanks very much for being here.